From the University of Arizona Distance Learning Program, this is Optical Sciences 505, Diffraction and Interferometry, with Dr. James White. This broadcast is authorized by the Arizona Board of Regents on behalf of the University of Arizona. Any reproduction or retransmission of this course or use of same for granting of credit without the express written consent of the University of Arizona is strictly prohibited. Well, I'll say good morning to everyone. First, let's uh, talk about the final exam. Last class, we talked about changing the date of the exam. Since then, I've had numerous uh, visitors in my office. It seems like any time we pick for the exam, it's a, it's a bad time for, for someone in this class. So I'm going to go back and, and put it at the time when the university had set it. I think that's, uh, well, I know that's not perfect. It uh, seems to be about as good as any time we can come up with. So it's May 14, 8 to 10, and it's in this room. And I think, you know, if you have a conflict with another um, uh, class, you have another exam the same day, maybe you can do something with the other class, which uh, maybe they can change the date. Maybe that class isn't as large or might be easier to change. I don't know. But it just, just doesn't seem to work out here to change the date. So let's keep it at May 14th, 8 to 10, and it will be here. And that will be a closed book exam. Um, pretty much like the two exams you've had during the semester. Any questions? Okay. Next, uh, I guess, time for corrections. One uh, student pointed out that I'd had a mistake in one of my answers. Um, so this was homework uh, set number 10. And um, the problem here, where we're finding the <coughs> diffraction pattern due to this uh, aperture here, and I had left an R out in the uh, denominator. So I've handed out here a correction sheet for this. It should be an R in both of these. Then, uh, just by accident or something yesterday, I noticed that I had another mistake here in problem set number 11. This one, I think, would be sort of obvious to anyone that um, I'd had a less than or equal to instead of uh, greater than here. So the, I guess it makes sense that the MTF is equal to zero at frequencies greater than the cutoff frequency. Okay. So it takes care of that. And the third is that I um, found out yesterday that Goodman has uh, on his uh, website, he had a um, uh, correction of a few errors in the second edition of Introduction to Fourier Optics. So I printed that out, made some copies, and brought that here. And I think there was one that actually pertained to something we covered in class, although what we did in class was correct. Uh, the equation in the book actually was incorrect. Um, and that was on page 317. It had to do with the um, um, image positions, the XY image positions uh, in a hologram reconstruction. And again, what we did in class was right, but if you try to go back and compare it with um, what was in uh, uh, Goodman's book, you would find a difference. But anyway, uh, this is the correction. Okay. And I guess the last thing before we get started is that um, every year you have a chance to uh, make your comments on the course. Um, and in the past, for the most part, we've just handed out the form, and it was up to you to, if you wanted to, fill it out and hand it in. And uh, I guess a lot of people have not been handing it in. So what Shoemaker has asked for this time is that we, uh, we give you time in class to fill out the form. And so we will do that next Tuesday. So you have between now and next Tuesday to think of all the good things about the course and also the bad things about the course. Okay. So I'll give you a chance to fill that out on on Tuesday. And I won't get to see it until after I give you the grade so you can say anything you want. Okay, let's go on with holography. Take a sip of coffee first. So, last class we were talking about rainbow holograms. 
and we'll repeat just a little bit of what we said and then we'll um, summarize what what uh, rainbow holograms are so remember the the idea here was that first we made a hologram a regular hologram of something flower pot in this case okay then we took that hologram so this was made using a diverging beam we took the hologram and we reconstructed it using the conjugate to the original reference beam so in this case that would be a converging beam and when we do that we will get a real image here now instead of using the entire hologram to produce this image we're going to use just a small portion of the hologram we're going to put a slit over the hologram and use the slit portion to form this image then we're going to make another hologram of that image and we're going to make that with a converging beam of light so here's a second exposure that we're going to produce okay so we're making a hologram of this flower pot and oh by the way we're making a hologram of this slit too which was way back here now what we do is that we process this hologram and we reconstruct that with the conjugate to this so that will be a diverging beam and when we do that we will produce a real image of the flower pot and over here well we also produce an image of a slit and so as long as we put our eyes where the slit is we will see the flower pot if we move our eyes up here we're away from where the image of the slit is well there's no light getting to our eyes so we won't see anything okay so there's a very limited field of view here where we can put our eyes and still see this image now the interesting thing what Steve Benton did when he developed this the interesting thing is if we reconstruct this not with a laser source but with a white light source but it's still a, a small white light source we will get well for the different colors we will get images of the slit in different locations and so you know the red light will be diffracted more and the blue light less and so we will have different images of the slit here and they will be different sizes too but the main thing is that they occur in different vertical positions and so if I put my eye here if I look through the blue image I will see a blue fl flower pot if I move up here to the red I will see a red flower pot but the idea is that all the wavelengths are dispersed here so even though I have a white light source here I still have a nice sharp image of a flower pot for a narrow bandwidth of wavelengths just that what the narrow bandwidth of wavelength is will change as I move my eyes up and down does everyone follow that so one question might be how big should this slit be and the idea here we, we won't go through any numbers in class but if you think about it for a little bit if I make the slit too small my resolution will be bad at least my resolution in the vertical direction will be bad I still have good horizontal resolution but if I make the aperture too small slit too small the resolution will be bad if I make the slit too large now these different colors are going to overlap too much and I'm going to get color blur okay well a lot of uh, display holograms have been made this way it became a very popular way of uh, making display holograms and I brought one to uh, class here that you can look at after class and it's one that was actually made by Steve Benton and uh, well, this is great here I can you can't see a thing but I can I see a nice uh, red image uh, kind of yellow green blue well, UV, I guess. I don't see it anymore. But. Okay. So after class, you can look at this. It's pretty good light. It says on here, it recommends using the sun as a light source. But Steve Benton's in Massachusetts. And um, I tried using the sun this morning as a light source. I'm still seeing spots out there. It's, uh, I think the Arizona sun is too bright for, for this hologram. Diffraction efficiency is too high. 
But these lights here are perfect. So after class, you can come up and, and look at this. Okay. As I told you last class, I used to teach a course in holography here, and we had a lab with it. And students went nuts making these rainbow holograms. They used up a lot of film. Okay, the next type we want to talk about here is the multiplex hologram. How many of you have seen the hologram when you walk around it, the girl blows a kiss at you? That's what this is. And it was invented by a man by the name of Lloyd Cross. And uh, Lloyd Cross was a, uh, one time was a student of Peter Franken's at uh, the University of Michigan. It was a long time ago. And um, he was a very clever student, but he dropped out of school and went into holography, moved to San Francisco, and started this little company making these, uh, making these holograms. So how do they work? He came here once and gave us a lecture. And uh, in fact, I had one of my students go up and visit him at one point, too. Kind of interesting guy. Anyway, this is taking again out of Goodman's book. So if we could zoom in on, um, okay, that's good. Just leave it there, and I'm going to first move down here and look at this. First, what he does is he actually had a rotating table, and um, he would put over what the object was on the table, and the table would would rotate, and you could take pictures as it as it rotates. And he typically took a picture every, uh, uh, well, I guess three pictures every degree or something like that. Let's see. Yeah, three pictures for every degree, it, it claims in, in Goodman's book. I don't think that's a real critical number. But anyway, uh, took a lot of pictures as the subject rotated. And for the, the girl you know, throwing, blowing you the kiss, that, as the table, as the pictures were taken, that's what she was how the scene was changing. So he has all of these pictures. And um, then he comes down here and he made this little projector. And this is kind of an interesting guy. So he puts the, the pictures in here and projects them out here and um, projects them onto a lens here, which is actually a cylinder lens. Now, in, in Goodman's book, he shows these other ones as being cylinders. And I guess maybe... Maybe they could be, but they don't need to be cylinders. The idea is that this guy right here is a cylinder. And so we're going to project the images here. And this is going to focus the light down to a, a strip here. Okay? And then he's going to bring in a reference beam either up here or in the other direction. And he's going to then uh, move this film sideways, you know, you make an exposure for one picture, move it sideways, make a second exposure, and so on. So he has all these strip holograms. So what we really have is a bunch of stereo pictures. And so now he takes this film and he puts it around into a, a cylinder, as you have seen, and puts a light source down here, replicating the uh, reference source. And now as you walk around the cylinder, well, you know, your eyes are seeing a couple of pictures, so you see depth through the stereo part here. And as you walk around here, you'll see different pairs of pictures. And so you see, well, it's just like having this object here and walking around and, and looking at this object. Okay. So it's pretty clever. The, the fancy part of his system was this big cylinder lens. And this cylinder lens has to be as large as um, the image that you have in here. And so if you go with the planetarium, whatever, and look at these, you'll, you realize that you know, the image is fairly large. And so this lens here had to be pretty large. And uh, Lloyd Cross was not a, a rich person, but he was a very clever person. And so his way of making this cylinder lens was to get a plastic bag 
and fill it with water. Okay, and that was his lens. So it worked well enough. You go and look in a planetarium. I mean, it's it's not perfect, but it's not bad. Now I don't know if Zmax has a capability of designing lenses that are plastic bags filled with water or not. But uh, anyway, Lloyd didn't need did not need Zmax. He designed it himself. Okay. So he made made a lot of these uh, multiplex holograms. Any questions on it? Okay. Well, I guess I have one more picture here I can show associated with this. It was in, let's look at this picture here. It's just looking at our drum. And again, we're getting, uh, it's a little bit like the rainbow hologram in that you're getting different colors at different uh, uh, positions here. They're being diffracted at different angles. And so as you move up and down or look up and down, you'll see different colors here. If you haven't been to the planetarium looking at the holograms there, and I, I hope they're still there, as far as I know. Has anyone been there recently? And I guess it's not a very uh, popular place on campus, is it? But anyway, I, there used to be one day a week you could go there free. I don't know if that's still true or not. But you should check that out and uh, go there and look at their, look at some of the holograms and look at the uh, multiplex hologram. One thing maybe I should say, I, I uh, didn't mention it before, but it's, uh, is that we're, you know, we're working with pairs of, of stereo pictures here. And so we have good parallax in the horizontal direction, but we have no vertical parallax. But that generally doesn't even, doesn't even bother you. Okay. The last thing that we should talk about here, mention here in... Um, these display holograms is uh, would be embossed holograms, and um, this is what you have on your your credit card, and uh, maybe some of you are concerned about your green card. I just heard the other day on the radio that uh, green cards are going to have holograms on them before long, so. The idea here is that you first you make a hologram, make a regular hologram, and you make it on use photoresist. And then in the photos photoresist in the development process, you um, wash away either the exposed portion of the photoresist or the unexposed portion of the photoresist, depending on whether it's positive or negative photoresist. Then you put a uh, silver spray on the hologram. And what we're going to um, do then is to make a metal master. And by using some electroforming process, we'll, we'll end up with this metal master. And um, then we will simply use the master or copies of the master to stamp out holograms. And so it's a very uh, inexpensive way of, uh, of making uh, holograms here. So I stamp them out. And then for reflection holograms, you might also, have, once you stamp out the hologram, you might also coat it to give it a high reflectivity. But they certainly make hundreds of millions of these uh, embossed holograms every, every year. And of course, the idea is that they're harder to, uh, to make counterfeit holograms. But once you've had this course, there should be no problem to that. So. Okay. Any other questions on this? Well, that has been by far the biggest application of holography, certainly, is in the, uh, in the credit card, or you know, some countries use it in the, uh, uh, put it on the money as well. In fact, do we have any on money? Some of the higher, I don't know, hundreds or five hundreds or something? 
you don't see the hundreds and five hundreds too often. I don't know if we do or not. I've seen it in other countries. So. Okay, let's go back. The last section I wanted to talk about in holography was going back and talking about volume holograms. And this is actually a section 17.6 that we had, had to skip. And with volume, we've, we've gone through looking at thin diffraction gratings and calculated the efficiencies that we could get. And um, uh, what we want to do now is, what if we take into account the effect that we can make a volume hologram? What diffraction efficiencies can we get? And what does that depend upon? And the end result is that we're going to see we can theoretically get efficiencies of 100%. And in practice, we can get efficiencies of greater than, than 90%. Now, the reference I'm going to use on this is um, Goodman's book, again. But I want to give you two other references that um, in some ways are better in the sense that they're more complete, but they, they would take a lot of time to, to cover. Um, a reference that I've used a lot over the years is a, a book on optical holography called Collier Burkhart and Lynn. And it's called Optical Holography. And it was published by Academic Press. And it's been out a long time. But the section on, on volume holograms and the coupled wave theory is um, superb, I think, in this. But if you really want to find out everything there is to know about coupled wave theory, and volume holograms. There's a superb paper on this by Kogelnik, K-O-G-E-L-N-I-K. And um, it's called Coupled Wave Theory. for thick hologram gratings. And it was published in the Bell System Technical Journal. And uh, I guess it's uh, volume 48 page 2909-2947, a long time ago, 1969. But I'll, I'll tell you, it covers everything you could possibly think of about coupled wave theory, all the different uh, um, conditions that you might come up with of uh, losses or no losses or, or uh, uh, gratings that are slanted at an angle inside of the hologram or not slanted and S polarization and P polarization and it, it goes on and on and on and uh, I will have to say it may not be the easiest paper in the world to, to read and understand but it is uh, it is complete and even though it's 30 years old it still is is the reference on on the subject Okay, so let's say we're going to make a hologram here. And we have a volume in the hologram. And um, again, I'll take something out of Goodman's book. This is page 334, I guess. That um, and we just might zoom in a little bit more on these four. Okay, thanks. Oh, well, mm -hmm. the comment I was going to make, for some reason, the... Um, grading of the homework is slowed down. So I, while I'm giving you solutions, I don't have the homework back yet for 11. And of course, that means I don't have 12. And uh, I will uh, try to check on that today to see what's happening to, to get it back as fast as we can. Anyway, making these holograms, 
we know that if we interfere, say, two plane waves, that the fringes, if uh, these are from point sources, so truly plane waves, the fringes are going to exist in all space where the two beams overlap, and they're going to bisect the angle between the two beams. And so if we go here to part A, where we have these two beams coming in, we will have these fringe planes in space, and they will exist throughout the grating here. And we will get some volume effects that's going to turn out when the thickness of the grating is uh, on the order of or greater than the spacing of the fringes. And if we, well, this is just another example of bringing in now not two plane waves, but a plane wave and a spherical wave. And so now the fringe planes, the angle of the fringe planes will vary in position here. If we make what we'll call a reflection hologram, now we bring in beams from two opposite sides here. We will also have these planes in space. And again, if they're plane waves, they're going to be, uh, well, will be planes here, separated by, um, well, depending on the angle between the two beams, but approaching half the wavelength inside the material. And uh, if we have a, you know, a plane wave coming in one side and a spherical wave coming in the other side, uh, again, we will have these uh, interference fringes which exist in space uh, and recorded in the, in the hologram here. And if we illuminate this with a plane wave, then the reconstructed beam will be just duplicating this beam, so that will be a spherical wave coming out, out here appearing to be coming from there. Okay, These volume reflection holograms are, turn out to be very interesting things. And, but before I say that, I have to look at the picture down at the bottom here, maybe. Um, so this is interfering two-point sources. And he says, these are ellipsoids of fringe maxima. Does that bother you in any way? doesn't bother you a bit. Ellipsoids, hyperbolites, right? And if you go to his correction sheet, he does correct that. In fact, if you have the latest printing of the paper of, the, of his book, I think it's corrected in that. So anyway, these are hyperbolites, not ellipsoids. Anyway, talking more about these volume reflection holograms here. Uh, these are interesting things. We said a little bit about them last class, but I'm going to say a little bit more here today, uh, or a lot more in a little bit when we get into the equations. So we said that if we make a hologram, and for simplicity, let's, um, um, let's take the case where we, we bring in beams at exactly the opposite direction. And so we get these fringe planes here. And so we said that, you know, my favorite equation, 2nd cosine theta is equal to lambda in air. And if theta uh, is uh, equal to zero, we would have that d is lambda air divided by uh, 2n. And so this, these get are separated by half the wavelength whatever the wavelength is in this material here. Now, if we were to change the, the angle of illumination, so theta changes, so then the wavelength at which this will read out is going to change. And so if we go away from normal incidence, so cosine theta becomes smaller, the readout wavelength would also become smaller. Or if in the development process of making the hologram, if, these, if this shrinks a little bit, so the spacing here becomes smaller, then the readout wavelength also will become smaller. Okay. Well, the question might be, when do we have to worry about the fact that it's a volume hologram? And uh, it's stated in Goodman's book, and if you go back to Kogelnik's papers, he will derive it for you. I'm not going to derive it, but when is a hologram a thick hologram. 
And it turns out uh, Kogelnik will des describe a parameter he calls Q, which he writes as 2 pi lambda in error times D, where D is the, uh, I don't like D for thickness, but D is the thickness of hologram. And divided by the refractive index of the hologram times the period of the hologram squared. The period, yeah. Well, that's equal to the period and the period squared here. And he says that it works out that you have to take into the account the fact that it's a volume hologram if Q is uh, greater than 2 pi. And this theory that we're going to look at here called the coupled wave theory um, is valid for, well, almost valid for q greater than 2 pi, but maybe a little bit better if q is greater than, than 10, theory that we're going to look at here. Okay. Well, in going through this thing called the coupled wave theory, the real thing that, that Kogonek took care of is that there's a coupling between the readout wave and what we call the signal wave. And the fact that as the readout wave goes through the hologram, it will be depleted. And so let's write that down. This hmm. is the main thing that coupled wave theory that Kogonek gave us in the coupled wave theory. So it takes into account depletion of the illumination wave as it passes through the hologram. And this is going to be very essential when the diffraction efficiency is high. So what we're saying here is let's take a um, transmission hologram first. And so the planes here, fringe planes, well, I'll draw them perpendicular to the sides. They may be slanted as well, but something like this. And so if we say this is the readout wave, as this propagates through here, maybe I should have used a different, different color for that. Not too late. We'll call that the readout wave R of Z. That is going to damp off or decay as we move through the hologram. While the signal wave S sub Z is going to increase as we move through the hologram. So I guess I should say maybe in the vertical direction this is the wave amplitude. Now, if this is, we'll see in a little bit, that if this hologram is thick enough, all of the readout energy will go into the signal energy. And then if it's still thicker, 
the signal energy will be fed back into the readout energy. And so as this becomes real thick, uh, you know, a certain thickness, we might get 100% um, efficiency, theoretically. We make it thicker, we can get down to 0% again. And to keep making it thicker, then we can get 100% again. We'll see that in the equations when we get to them. So that's for a transmission hologram. If we take a reflection hologram, So now the planes are, well, they may not be parallel to the sides, but they may be slanted a little bit, but they're basically in this direction. And um, now if we illuminate from the left here, uh, the readout signal will go down. So that's RZ. So that's the readout. So I was trying to do that in red. So as it goes through here, and the signal, since for the reflection hologram, the light is reflected back towards the left here, the signal is going to be maximum here. So this is S sub Z. Okay. So this would also be a maximum in the in the readout side. So S is the signal wave. So anyway, the, the whole point is that he took care of the factor that the amount of energy in the readout changes as we go through the as we go through the hologram. Now we're not going to um, go through the all the analysis here. We're just kind of outline the analysis. In fact, Goodman doesn't go through the whole analysis um, by any means either. And if we were to go through the analysis, it would take a couple of classes, at least two or three. But anyway, kind of the approach here Kogelnik took is that first we'll start off with a scalar uh, wave equation. So del squared u plus k squared u is equal to zero. So this is page uh, Goodman, page 337. Now our holographic material can have either um, an index variation, that's a function of position, for a phase hologram, or it can have an absorption as a function of position for an amplitude type hologram, or we don't do it in this analysis, but it could have both the um, phase variation and the amplitude variation. And so we'll say that the refractive index here goes as uh, some average value plus some variation, n1 cosine, uh, depending on the on the fringe planes here. So the k is the what we call the grading vector. So we can have a sinusoidal, a cosinusoidal index variation, or for an amplitude hologram. So this is phase hologram. For an amplitude hologram. We could have an absorption that goes as some alpha naught plus alpha one cosine k dot r. Okay. Now, when you go through this analysis, it gets complicated pretty fast. And so there are some simplifying things that Kogunik used. Um, assumptions. that are normally used in the um, coupled wave theory. 
I need a sip of coffee before I can write these down. So first off, we're going to assume the hologram is thick enough that only two waves need to be considered. Now when we talked about thin diffraction gratings, remember in general we have many, many different orders. Here we're assuming that it's thick enough that it's selecting out only the zero order. So that's the readout beam and the plus one order, the order of interest here. So anyway, we, Kogelnik, uh, we will assume that that's, uh, that's the case. Um, and so we're saying that the total field um, field will consist of only two waves. And so we write that at U will be the readout and um, so we have some readout wave and we have some signal wave. The, another assumption that we're going to make here is that the, the absorption in the distance of a wavelength is small. And the other thing the variation in the refractive index. Yep. Um, U of R is equal to R of Z plus S of Z. I can't read your handwriting in the yeah. exponent. Well, this is just some uh, rho dot R. And this is, a, to use his notation, it would be a sigma dot R. Yeah. <laughs> may not look like it. But. <laughs> um, you can use whatever symbols you want here. How's that? Okay. So the next is that the variation in the refractive index is small compared to its mean. The variation in the refractive index Maybe I'll try a different pen. I don't know if that will probably take more than that to help my handwriting. But, uh. Okay. So I think I'll go along here. There's several. Um, you can, the interested student here, I think, can go along and follow the algebra in uh, uh, Goodman's book if you, uh, if you want to here. But I'm just going to go along here and look at what results that we would get here for different types of, uh, of gradings here. And then we'll talk about these results a little bit. So the first result we want to look at here is for a thick phase grading. And I should say transmission. Okay. And there will be a result.
result here that um, the efficiency, the monolite in the zero order, or in the first order, excuse me, monolite in the first order divided by the uh, uh, incident energy goes as a um, sine squared, and we'll define the symbols in just a second here, or well, phi square root of 1 plus, uh, I'll write this way, chi squared divided by phi squared, and then down here divided by 1 plus uh, chi squared uh, divided by phi squared. And phi here is defined as pi times n1. So n1, remember that was the um, variation in refractive index. It varied as n1 cosine um, times d, the thickness of the grating, divided by lambda cosine theta. And the chi here is going to be a measure of how much we depart from the uh, uh, the Bragg condition, how much we depart from the proper condition for maximum efficiency. And that will go as capital K. Um, let's see, the K associated with the, uh, uh, the uh, period of the grading. D, thickness, divided by 2 cosine theta. And then delta theta cosine of theta minus psi, and I'll have to define that in a minute since I didn't show that picture, minus delta lambda over 2 times the period of the grading. And let's go back and find the picture of the, um, so we know what the angles are here we're talking about. And so the angles here, if we could zoom in on that. So this is our grading. These are the grading planes. Uh, this is our, our beam coming in here, our beam leaving. And um, this psi here is what we'll call the slant of the uh, grading lines, how much it differs from being perpendicular to the surfaces. D, as we said, was the thickness here. And theta is the angle between the grading planes and the, uh, the readout beam. And all these angles are measured inside the material, not outside, but inside the material. Okay. So this parameter right here is a measure of how we depart from the Bragg condition, how we depart from the maximum efficiency. If we change the wavelength by a certain amount here, uh, or if we change the angle of incidence by a certain amount. So for the best efficiency, we will let delta lambda and delta theta be equal to zero, and we're going to end up with the result but the efficiency here is just sine squared of phi, where that phi is, was the uh, pi n1 d over lambda cosine theta. And if we make a plot of that, the plot would go Again, if we could zoom in on this. So the first one of these is the uh, signal here. And the second one, the dashed line, would be the readout. And then this is a function of phi. So it's a function of the, um, uh, think of it as a function of the thickness of the, of the grating. And so there's a coupling uh, between the readout and the signal. And if we make this just the right thickness here, we'll get 100%, theoretically, get 100% into the diffracted beam. 
uh, if we keep increasing the thickness, now what's happening is that the diffracting beam, the, the signal beam will now diffract back into the readout beam. And so the readout beam would increase and the signal beam would decrease, i.e. these two are coupled relative to one another. Okay. Now it's kind of interesting to think a little bit about when, when do we get maximum efficiency here. And so this will occur, well, it occurs when this sine is equal to 1. And so it will occur when, um, and just write this down again, that this was equal to pi n1 d over lambda cosine theta. If we think here for a second, n1 d over cosine theta is equal to the optical path difference, optical path length maybe I should say, which would be experienced if the average value of the index were n1. So as we go through this grading here of thickness d, and we're going through at an angle of theta here, d over cosine theta is the path that we go through here. And um, the OPD, if the average value of the index were n1, this is what the optical path difference, we, the optical path length we would see in just propagating through here. And this is equal to a maxima uh, when this is equal to lambda over 2, the first max. Now, one kind of practical question you might have, you know, can I ever, we, we saw the efficiency theoretically goes to 1. In practice, can I ever achieve that? Can I get a high enough index variation to achieve that? So let's look at a couple of numbers here to get a feeling for that. So we want n1 d cosine divided by cosine theta to be a half wave for the first max. Possible values. If we look at films and bleaching of films, or look at um, dichromated gelatin, what kind of index changes can we get? It turns out you can get numbers that go as 0.01 or 0.02 without a lot of difficulty. And remember, this was the coefficient of the cosine, so we're really saying that the delta n is 0.02 to 0.04. So those are the kind of index variations that you can get in common films or common or dichromated gelatin. A common thickness here for these materials is like 15 microns. And let uh, theta equal 30 degrees. And let lambda equal half a micron, for example. And so for an efficiency of 1, we would have the N1 d over cosine theta is about a half a wave. And this implies that N1 is like um, um, not 0.05 waves, but 0.5 waves. Okay. N1 is 0.5 uh, times 0.5 from here times the cosine of 30 degrees um, divided by 15. Everything's in units of microns here. And so that's about 0.14 is what we would need for an index variation. And that's what we can get. So in really using common uh, films or dichromated gelatin, you do have enough range in the refractive index variation to theoretically get efficiencies of 100%. And in practice, people do get greater than 90%. 
Okay. So the numbers match out pretty nicely. Now down here, he um, Goodman also makes a inter interesting plot here of the efficiency as a function of the phi. So we have our sinusoidal variation here. And then he puts in how we have detuned this by either by changing the wavelength or by changing the angle of incidence. And um, see how the efficiency drops off. So these guys are going to be pretty, they're somewhat angle sensitive. If you, you make a hologram and use it at 30 degrees, you can try to use it too far from 30 degrees, the efficiency will drop quite a lot unless you some way change the wavelength to compensate for that. Okay. So for a thick phase hologram can get 100% efficiency. Thick phase hologram max diffraction efficiency 100%. Okay. How about for a thick amplitude transmission hologram? I, I keep forgetting to write here transmission. But. Okay, so now let's look at a thick amplitude transmission hologram. Well, if we, if we um, will match the Bragg conditions, so we are using the right angle of incidence and the, white, the right wavelength, and so this chi factor is equal to zero, it will turn out that the efficiency here yeah, it's a little bit of a mess. Um, it's going to go first as e to the minus 2 alpha naught d over cosine of theta. Now remember, alpha naught was the average absorption. d over cosine theta is um, how far we're going through the hologram. So this is just attenuation here due to the average absorption of the hologram. Then we get a hyperbolic sink squared of alpha 1 d over 2 cosine theta. Okay. If we make a plot of that, would be a plot here of the efficiency. And it zips all the way up here to about 3.7%. Hmm. So it's not nearly as exciting as the thick phase transmission hologram. And then it drops off here. So the largest efficiency we can get here for this thick amplitude hologram is only about it's less than 4%, 3.7%. And so the, the interest in thick transmission amplitude holograms is maybe not too high. So let's just write that down here. That the maximum efficiency for thick transmission holograms about 3.7%. Mm -hmm. 
So normally, if you're making a thick hologram, a thick transmission hologram, you end up either using something like dichromated gelatin, so you have a phase hologram to begin with, or if you make it in film, you'll make your thick amplitude. You will bleach the film to convert the amplitude into a phase variation. So you can go from your 3.7% up to something uh, approaching 100%. So kind of kind of grim here, the results that you get in this case. Okay, any questions at this point? OK. Well, we have two more types of holograms to look at here. And um, they're much more interesting than the thick amplitude transmission hologram. So let's go on to the reflection holograms. And let's look at a thick phase reflection hologram. And um, well, I'll write down the case where we're not at optimum angle or optimum wavelength, uh, where we depart from the Bragg condition, and then we'll go to the Bragg condition case. This turns out to be one plus, you know, it's a mess here. 1 minus chi squared over phi squared. And these are defined the same way as they were previously defined by the hyperbolic sine uh, squared of phi square root of 1 minus chi squared over phi squared. And if we're at the Bragg condition, so we're illuminating at the right angle and the right wavelength, so chi is equal to zero, this will turn out to be the hyperbolic tangent squared of phi. And um, so we can do a plot of that also. And then I want to come back and look at uh, what happens if we're not right at the, the break condition here. Uh, this is a, a plot here, and in this case, he's kind of switch the way that things are plotted. Here we have phi and here we have the chi. And that the important thing is that this can go up to 100% here. Okay. And in practice, people actually do get greater than 90% making of these thick phase reflection holograms. Now, these, as we said before, these think of these thick holograms as really having made into them uh, like a, a thin film filter. And so if you illuminate this with white light, it's going to select the wavelength, uh, a small band of wavelengths, and reconstruct that. And so these these reflection holograms, again, if you, when, you, when you go to the planetarium, I won't say if you go to the planetarium, when you go to the planetarium, you will see some nice um, reflection holograms that they illuminate with white light. And um, uh, typically, the, the end result would be a green hologram, but a green reconstruction. But it has built into that um, 
a, um, uh, a filter. And I thought I would go through a little analysis here, and this is, uh, comes out of uh, the Collier reference, but I think we could also pull it out of the, um, out of the Goodman's uh, equations here. Okay. I want to see if we take this thick reflection transmission hologram, what bandwidth it will work over. Question? Efficiency. Is this supposed to be one over that? Um, no, I think it will actually turn out to be that. Uh, minus one in it. Oh, well, let me look here. Yeah, you're probably right. Whatever. Yeah. Let me look here for a second. You're probably right. Can't even find it right now. Oh, the one that is right. This one here is right, but this is minus one, right? In fact, I guess otherwise it wouldn't make much sense. That, uh, yeah, this is minus one here. Thank you. Another question? Uh, MP2. Uh, if even the uh, phase hologram uh, has very high efficiency, but uh, um, I think the amplitude hologram they have the, um, because the transmittance is linear to the amplitude of the inside beam, but for the phase hologram is the, uh, the the linearity of the phase and the 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 amplitude of the uh, inside beam. They have the same kind of um, linearity. Well, you know, you're saying that the phase there's not a good linearity between phase yeah. and um, exposing intensity. Mm -hmm. But I think they still have a much better efficiency with the phase. Yeah, and, and so they like to so they like to use the phase instead of the amplitude. Mm -hmm. Turns out these linearity, whether it's linear or not, probably matters more when you do the math than it does in in practice, it makes the math much easier. But as far as the end result from the hologram, uh, it's not it's not as critical whether it's linear or not. So I think normally you to get the you normally you, you would rather use a um, uh, a phase hologram because of the efficiency. And the uh, when we go to the reflection hologram, it's the same deal again. You only get a few percent, maybe seven percent or something for the amplitude reflection um, hologram. Well, for the phase, you approach 100%. Even in practice, you approach 100%. Yeah. Any other question? OK, so this was minus 1. This is still right, right here. Though. What I wanted to do was the outline. I'm about ready to run out of time here, but I'll and see. Another question. Mm -hmm. For the phase reflection hologram, it seems that if you, you got more thickness for the film, you got got more refraction back, more efficiency. Is that right? Is In the, I missed the question about the... Uh, is, this is the efficiency is uh, arctangent, and in five is... Uh, right, if we look at the efficiency... If you, you got more thickness of the hologram, turns out that the efficiency is, you can reach the two. 100 percent now. That's right. For the, for the uh, reflection hologram here, it's a little bit different from the transmission hologram. In a transmission hologram, if we made the hologram too thick, the efficiency could drop down again. For the reflection hologram, uh, if you make it too thick, you still have a very high efficiency. And the, what's really happening is if it's real thick in the reflection hologram, your signal, your readout beam has all turned in signal beam, and you don't even use the last part of the hologram. No light even gets to that because it's all reflected back. So you can't make a, th a thick uh, reflection hologram too thick, while a transmission hologram you can make too thick. Uh, refreshing can we make too thick? Not for reflection. Reflection cannot be too thick. You still, you do not, uh, you do not lose efficiency in a reflection hologram by making it too thick. Transmission, you can. 
Well, I think I was going to go through a little derivation here. I don't think I really have, um, have maybe time to do it here, but let me, I'll just outline what I was going to do. I was going to go in and look at the uh, parameter for the mismatch from the Bragg condition. I'll just write it down here. It was KD over 2 cosine theta, uh, delta theta, cosine of theta minus psi minus delta lambda divided by the period here, twice the period. And I was going to look at, for a thick hologram, how much the wavelength could change here such that the efficiency goes to zero. And if we look at our plot here, the efficiency is going to go to zero here when chi approaches something like three and a half or so. So. Um, efficiency equals zero if chi is about three and a half. And then we were going to go through here and solve for delta lambda for this case. And uh, I was going to put in a thickness here of um, 15 microns, since that's kind of a typical thickness here, and an index, average index of one and a half. And we would have ended up with a result here that the efficiency would go to zero when delta lambda is approximately 40 angstroms. So the point was that if we take a thick transmission hologram, illuminate it with a white light, it's only going to reflect back to us a band pass of about 40 angstroms. And so it works very well with white light. The last, th last thing in this section, and I want to kind of finish this off today because I want to talk about speckle on Tuesday. The last thing here was to talk about a thick amplitude reflection hologram. And in that case, the efficiency, I'll let you, um, I'll let you go to uh, Goodman's book and look at the equations. But it's going to turn out the maximum efficiency is only about 7.2%. And so again, you know, if you're making a reflection hologram, you really would like to have the phase hologram as opposed to the uh, amplitude hologram. And if we, again, if we go to Goodman's book, just summarizing the results here, if we could zoom in on this, that for a phase transmission hologram, theoretically, you can get 100%. In practice, people get better 90%. Amplitude transmission, theoretically, up to 3.7%. Uh, people experimentally get up to about 3%. Phase reflection hologram, theoretically, 100%. In practice, people get greater than 90%. Amplitude reflection hologram, theoretically 7.2%. And people, uh, the best people get is on the order of 4%. So this kind of summarizes what the maximum efficiencies you can expect to get. So I think I'm about out of time, so I'll see you on Tuesday, and we will talk about speckle interferometry.